Gold by Helen Grant Gold, that's what's in it for me. The speaker himself had a gilded appearance. Fair hair bleached almost white by the sun. Tanned skin with a faint metallic sheen of perspiration. His green eyes were flecked with motes of gold, giving them an opalescent appearance at once beautiful and cold. Decker knew him as Mertens, but that was probably not his original name. It was hot inside the café, and hotter still outside. Within there were flies, attracted by the smell of food. Several of them were exploring the sticky residue of sugar in the glass teacups. Outside there was dust and the stabbing brightness of the midday sun. "'If there's gold, why would you share it with me?' asked Decker bluntly. Mertens raised a hand in a pantomime of helplessness. "'You know I can't sell anything on, not after what happened last time. That sanctimonious little prick of a curator has seen to that. You can't blame him, said Decker, mildly. It's not a matter of blame. It's fact. He's ruined a business. It took me decades to build. An illegal business. Mertens gave a contemptuous snort. Don't be so holy of them now. I can go elsewhere, you know. He picked up the packet of cigarettes lying next to his cup, as though he meant to leave. All right, said Decker hastily. I was just making conversation. Tell me about it. This place. Where is it? Mertens looked at him for a few moments, letting silence stretch out between them. His reticence was intended to say, I don't need you. I'm having to consider whether to trust you at all. Decker knew this perfectly well, and he simply waited. I don't need to tell you, said Mertens eventually. He leaned towards Decker, elbow on the stained tabletop, the cigarette pack still clasped in his fingers. His other hand, the right one, remained jammed in his pocket, Decker noticed. I'll take you there. You couldn't find it on your own anyway, even if I did tell you. Decker doubted that. He'd spent at least as long in this part of the world as Mertens had. He thought the man didn't want to tell him in case Decker decided to do some investigating of his own and cut Mertens out of it. Now it was his turn to be silent, as he thought about this, and about the hand he couldn't see thrust deep into the man's pocket. What did he have in there? A knife? A small pistol? Why would he threaten me, though? he said to himself. He needs me to sell whatever he's found. If something happens to me now, that's not going to happen. When do you want to go, he said at last, and he saw Mertens relax, almost imperceptibly. I've got a vehicle outside, said Mertens, nodding towards the doorway. Now? Why not now? You're not doing anything else, are you? That was certainly true. There was nothing Decker couldn't put off for a day or even a week. There were no colleagues looking impatiently at their watches, waiting for his return. There wasn't anyone in the slovenly digs he called home. He got to his feet and followed Mertens outside, leaving a little heap of grubby banknotes to cover the tea. The vehicle proved to be a battered jeep parked in the shade of a compound wall, its driver dozing behind the wheel. Decker should not have been surprised to see the man. Most foreigners employed a local driver rather than negotiate the chaotic roads themselves, but he was still aware that he was now outnumbered. He swallowed his unease, reminding himself that Mertens needed him. There was no need to suspect any threat to himself. Mertens got in beside the driver. Decker climbed into the back. The engine roared into life, drowning out whatever Mertens said to the driver, but after they pulled away, Mertens turned round and shouted, He doesn't speak English. You can say what you like. Decker nodded. He didn't believe Merton. Since he'd arrived in the country, he hardly ever met anyone who didn't speak at least some English. Speaking to the driver would have been pointless, though, since it was nearly impossible to converse over the rumble of the engine and the air rushing past them as they accelerated. They drove out of the city, heading into the sun. Shops and cafes gave way to suburbs and then to arid open land with a sprinkling of desiccated shrubs. The road was almost the same colour as the sandy earth, and the air was unpleasantly gritty. The jeeps passing threw up a great plume of dust. Twice, they passed through villages where the plainly constructed houses were also the colour of the earth. Men sitting outside tiny cafes watched in curiously as they passed. Once a group of little boys tried to run after the jeep, laughing and shouting. After the second village there was a long period of time in which Decker saw no habitations at all. Mertens turned again in his seat and handed over a plastic bottle of the local mineral water. The water was tepid, but Decker drank it gratefully. The sun was halfway down the sky when they came to a broad chasm with a river flowing along the bed of it. The jeep stopped a few metres from the edge. Mertens got out and Decker followed. 
The driver remained inside. As Decker was climbing out, he saw a movement out of the corner of his eye and glanced back. There was a blue and white glass talisman hanging from the rearview mirror, and the man had reached up to touch it. Isn't he coming? he asked Mertens, jerking his head in the direction of the jeep. No, said Mertens. He's from that last village. None of them will come here. Why not? said Decker. No, let me guess. It's that time-honoured cliché, the cursed place, where none of the locals will go? Mertens grunted mirthlessly. Think yourself lucky. If they did go there, the place would have been picked clean long ago. He led Decker towards a gap in the bank which gave onto a steep slope, leading right down to the water. Decker looked back at the jeep. The engine was no longer running. The windshield glass reflected the brilliant sunshine, so the driver was invisible. A moment later, they were making their way down the slope, and the jeep vanished from sight. It took some time to get down to the riverbed. The surface of the slope was loose and treacherous. Decker imagined himself slipping, going over, hearing the snap of an ankle breaking. He winced. When they got to the bottom, Mertens gestured upstream. It's ten, maybe fifteen minutes from here. In fact, it took twenty. Decker wasn't as fit as Mertens, and he didn't know the ground. He put his foot into an unexpectedly damp hollow and felt viscous mud oozing into his leather shoe. After that, he looked at Mertens' firmly laced boots with envy. As they moved up river, the bank developed a more pronounced overhang. Decker was perspiring heavily now, and strands of dark hair were sticking to his forehead. He looked up the bank and saw what seemed like pieces of masonry half buried in the sandy earth. If he'd not been so hot and tired, he'd have stopped to take a closer look. As it was, Mertens was forging ahead, and he had to exert himself to keep up. There, said Mertens at last, pointing. Protruding from the bank was a great chunk of stone. It was clearly not a natural rock formation. The smooth face and geometrically precise corners at the top proved that. At a little distance was another slab, seemingly damaged. A sliver of stone several metres long had sheared off it, leaving a rugged surface. Between the two was a dark opening, taller than it was wide. The rim of it was crumbling, but its shape was still suggestive of human design. The two men laboured their way up the slope. Halfway to the opening, Decker motioned for Mertens to stop for a moment. He was breathing hard, his mouth unexpectedly dry. When he caught his breath a little, he nodded at the gap. It's man-made, all right, and it could be from the correct period. But it can't be Midas' tomb, you know that. They found that in 1957, in Gordian. I didn't say it was Midas' tomb, said Mertens, tersely. I said it was associated with Midas. There are inscriptions, then? No, I told you. There's gold. Decker stared at him. There are holes all over this story, he thought. No inscriptions? It could be anything. And if there were enough gold in there for people to start talking about Midas, it would have been plundered long ago, local superstition or not. Merton stared back briefly, seeing scepticism on Decker's face. Then he began to ascend the slope again, floundering in the loose sand. When he fell to his knees, Decker thought he'd simply stumble. But then Merton's was pawing at the sand with his hands, unearthing something. Something, Decker noticed, that gleamed in the sunlight. Here, shouted Mertens over his shoulder, and Decker went up the slope to see what he'd uncovered. It was a hand, a golden hand. As Decker approached, the sunshine was briefly reflected from it, dazzlingly. Then his shadow fell across it, and he was able to see it more clearly. It was brilliantly realistic. He knelt to examine it, and saw how beautifully the anatomy of the hand was done. The taut rope of the palmaris longus, the cushion of the thenar eminence, the fingernails, the creases of the palm, the very walls of the fingertips were perfectly executed, and stunningly it did genuinely appear to be fashioned of gold. It was bright and untarnished, suggesting purity, although perhaps the cleanness of the surface was the work of the shifting sands. A very high carat gold would be too soft for a statue of this size, Decker judged. The work was so fine that he longed to see the piece in its entirety. He scraped at the sand in which it was buried, uncovering several inches of gleaming forearm. But it was clear that to exhume the thing completely was the work of hours, if not days. As fast as he scooped out the sand, more of it subsided into the hole. Mertens was standing over him, watching. Come on, he said. There's more further in, and not buried so deeply. Decker stood up, brushing sand from his trouser legs. This is astounding, he said. A find like this... 
belongs in a museum, finished Mertens, so ironically that Decker felt a transitory twinge of guilt. If you want to spend the rest of your life living in a shithole and fencing amphorae to tourists, be my guest. Just make sure you sell my half of the goods before you piss yours away. Let's go, said Decker, shortly. He had no desire to justify himself to Mertens. It will be an empty exercise anyway. Besides, the desire to know what lay further inside the cave was boiling up inside him. Rich, he thought. We're rich, both of us. The heat, the tiredness no longer held him back. He fought his way up the last part of the slope to the entrance, his arms wheeling. And stopped. What he saw there, under the shadow of the great stone lintel, reminded him of nothing so much as a lucky dip at a children's party. Half buried in the sandy soil were things, a bottle, a long-bladed knife, what looked like a boot. There were other things that were less easy to recognise, roughly textured objects that might have represented withered fruit or chunks of bread. All of them had that mesmerising yellow gleam that said, I am gold. Decker lost his head for a little while. He tried to gather these things up, all of them, though it would have been impossible for one man to carry away even a fraction of what lay half obscured by the sand. Each time he picked something up, it seemed that he saw something bigger and more valuable within an arm's reach. He dropped as much as he caught up, almost sobbing aloud in his desperation to lay hands on all of it. Merton's was a silent presence at his shoulder, watching. Decker sobered up at last when he came upon a second statue. This time, it was not a hand that protruded from the ground. It was a golden head, shoulders, an arm. The scale of it, it would have been the same size as himself if all of it had been visible, was enough to stop him in his tracks. But what really struck him was the expression on the metal face. It was frozen in a silent scream, jaws agape, cheeks bulging, eyes squeezed into slits. Every anatomical feature Decker noticed, was faithfully reproduced, down to a chipped tooth in the upper jaw. It was masterfully done, and chilling. My God, he said. What's it meant to be? The other man shrugged, which didn't surprise Decker. Mertens knew the street value of almost everything, but had no interest in the provenance of any of it. It might be Leocorn, Decker said, answering his own question. Or an enemy being slain in battle, it's amazingly powerful. The word sounded flat, even to his own ears. Powerful didn't begin to cover what it was. Horrible might have been nearer the mark. He found himself reluctant to touch the statue in spite of its alluring golden sheen. It struck him that there would be no great pity to melt the thing down. He glanced at Mertens, standing there coolly observing him. We can't possibly move all this in one go. We'll have to decide what to take first, test the market. Are you sure this place is safe? Mertens nodded. I told you, none of the locals will come here. He tilted his head to indicate that they should go further in. You should go in and see everything. Then you can decide. Decker looked doubtfully into the interior. It was dark in there, too dark to make out very much. But Mertens had evidently prepared for this. He crossed the cave and retrieved an old-fashioned lantern, the kind Decker thought of as a camping lantern. He set it down on the ground, kneeling by it as he did so, took out a cigarette lighter and lit it carefully. Decker noticed that Merton's right hand remained in his pocket the entire time he did this. "'What's in your pocket?' he asked abruptly, and Merton's head jerked up towards him. "'My hand,' said Merton. "'Why?' "'Sprain,' Merton stood up, raising the lantern in his left hand. Decker opened his mouth to ask another question, but then he looked into the cave, and whatever he'd wanted to say went right out of his head. He simply gaped. From the spot where they stood, the floor sloped gradually upwards to the bottom of a flight of stone steps. The walls on either side had been carved into smooth stone panels, interspersed with tall niches, all of them empty. As the two men advanced, and the light from the lantern penetrated further into the gloom, Decker was able to make out an altar hewn out of the living rock. On it stood a figure, fashioned out of the same glistening yellow metal as the objects littering the sand, but of a startlingly grotesque nature. Unlike the other statues, it wasn't life-sized. Had it been able to climb down from the altar and waddle up to Decker, the top of its head would scarcely have come up to his hip. Squat and ill-proportioned, 
It had a bulbous belly, a broad face surrounded with a corona of unkempt hair, and, peculiarly, the long ears of a horse. Silenus, said Decker. He began to climb the steps. He had to see the statue close up. This is extraordinary, he said. I never heard of a shrine dedicated specifically to Silenus, let alone anything like this. When he became aware that Mertens was not following him, he glanced back. The other man was standing at the bottom of the flight of steps, watching him, but making no moves to follow. Well, maybe Mertens had seen the statue a dozen times before. But Decker said to himself, Oh, no one with an interest in art, even if only a commercial interest, could get tired of studying this piece. He reached the top of the steps, and now he could have put out a hand and touched the long ears or rubbed the gleaming curve of the belly. He didn't, though, not right away. He simply gazed at the statue, taking in every tiny detail. Merton's confident assertion that the place was associated with Midas made sense now. It was from Silenus that King Midas, legendarily, obtained the Golden Touch. Quite how this translated into an obscure cult of Silenus, into which such riches were poured, was less obvious. Perhaps, thought Decker, it was the other way round. Perhaps the cult inspired the legend. The idea was tremendously exciting, even for someone whose main interest in archaeology was financial. Apart from anything else, it increased the value of the find to a dizzying extent. He would have to consider very carefully who, among his clientele, had the ability to pay what this was worth, not to mention the considerable cost of an unofficial export. He turned to face Mertens boldly. I'm in, he called down, but I want this piece, specifically this one. Mertens gazed up at him in silence for a few moments. Then he said, All right, speaking almost casually. Decker was momentarily taken aback, having expected more resistance. But, he reflected, there's enough gold here to make us both very rich indeed. What does he care who takes what? We can move this now, if both of us lift it, he called. He saw something pass across Mertens' face. Something like a flinch. Was the man bulking now? when unimaginable wealth was within their grasp. But then Merton said, I think it's fixed to the altar. Try it. He made no attempt to ascend the steps to where Decker stood. There was a stillness about him, as though he were waiting for something. Decker looked down at him. Then he turned back to the statue and grasped it firmly by the shoulders, using both hands. Behind him he heard Merton's exhale sharply, a sound like steam escaping. If the statue moved when he applied the force of his hands, he didn't feel it. Instead, he felt something so instantaneous and strange that he wondered briefly whether he'd been electrocuted. A sensation of cold and brittle tingling, as though he'd thrust his hands into a heap of metal filings. For several seconds, he did not remove his hands from the statue. It wasn't that he couldn't exactly, but more that he didn't seem able to think of doing it. The skin of his hands and fingers crawled with myriad tiny pinpricks. Seconds stretched past, and then suddenly Decker seemed to snap back into normal consciousness. He pulled his hands away from the golden flesh and held them out in front of him, turning them over in confusion. What the hell just happened? He turned to Mertens and saw on the other man's face a blend of exultation and fear. Decker descended a couple of steps, hands still outstretched, and he saw Mertens take several paces backward. Stop, said Mertens tersely. And Decker, in his confusion, actually did stop. He stood on the steps, looking at Mertens, at that strange, savage expression on the man's face. "'Do you know what you've done?' asked Mertens, and Decker shook his head. "'You have it now. The touch. You've got it, Decker.' Decker moved restlessly and saw Mertens back away another couple of paces. He felt odd. Sick, perhaps. Something felt wrong. He couldn't put his finger on it. Mertens was fumbling in his breast pocket. He fished out a battered pack of cigarettes, stepped forward, watching Decker warily, and threw them up onto the steps near Decker's feet. Pick those up, he said, and you'll see. Decker looked at him. He was tempted to say no. It seemed a pointless thing to do. Was Mertens playing some sort of absurd practical joke on him? But then he stooped and picked up the cigarettes. He felt something then, something like the sensation he'd had when he touched the golden Silenus, except that now... It seemed to be within his own flesh, a seething feeling that was right inside the epidermis. Shocked, he closed his hand involuntarily around the packet, gripping it. 
and then he opened it again, staring, because it didn't feel the way it should have done, not at all. Instead of shiny cardboard that gave way, under the pressure of his fingers, he felt a cold, hard surface, unmistakably that of metal. Decker gazed down at the pack in his hand. Gold. He squeezed his eyes closed for a second, as though he'd had the worst migraine ever, and he opened them. The pack was still golden. This is some trick, he said to himself. It was already gold. He had this thing made to mess with my head. At that moment he could think of no possible reason why Merton should have done that. But it made more sense than any other explanation. It made more sense, for example, than the idea that he himself had turned the packet of cigarettes to gold by touching it. Decker felt in his pocket. His wallet was in there, stuffed with mostly useless cards and a wad of the local banknotes. His fingers touched it, closed around it, began to draw it out of his pocket. Before he even set eyes on it, he knew that it was not the same as it had been. He had some difficulty extracting it from his pocket at all. The weave of the fabric was strangely stiff, as though it had been woven from tiny wires. The wallet itself gleamed in the lantern light, a cold yellow gleam. Decker opened it and saw that the banknotes, still separate and removable, were made of fine metal leaf. If it were gold, as it appeared to be, they were worth considerably more now than they had been before. He looked at Merton standing below him, his posture tense as though ready for flight. "'What have you done to me?' he asked. "'You did it to yourself,' said Merton. "'It's a shame you had to touch that thing with both hands, Decker.' "'No,' he added sharply. "'Don't try to come anywhere near me. "'Touch me, and you'll never find out how to get yourself out of this.' Merton saw that Decker had stopped and exhaled heavily. All right, keep your distance, and I'll tell you the deal. Don't try anything. The driver knows about the Phrygian curse. If you try to go back to the jeep alone, he'll drive off without you. You'll die out here, Decker. The Phrygian curse? Decker shook his head, bewildered. The Midas touch, if you prefer, said Merton. You poor bastard. Everything you touch is going to turn to gold. That's not possible, said Decker. It's not possible. He opened his hand and the gleaming wallet fell out of it onto the stone step. It shouldn't be possible, agreed Mertens. And yet, he shrugged. Decker crumpled into a sitting position on the step. No, he said, shaking his head. He reached out and took a handful of dirt, let it fall through his fingers. As it fell, it glistened. Gold dust. He looked at Mertens piteously. Will it... Will I turn everything I touch to gold? What if I touch myself? Merton's laughed a short, mirthless bark. <laughs> you won't turn yourself to gold. I don't know why not, but that's not how it works. Lucky for you, because I'm not volunteering to hold your dick for you so you can piss. And it's just your hands. You can touch stuff with any other part of yourself and nothing will happen. So you can still eat, so long as you don't use fingers. Decker groaned. He took another handful of sand and another and watched the gold dust sift through his fingers to the floor. After a while, he put his head up and looked at Merton's. Why did you do this to me? What did I do to deserve it? Nothing, said Merton's. It's not personal. There just aren't that many people I could ask to come out here. The locals are terrified of this place and not many of the expats are as crooked as you. He made this last statement in a tone that suggested admiration, but it was lost on Decker. Tell me how to stop it, he said. He was weeping. He believed it now utterly. I will, Merton's promised. But you have to do something for me first, he shrugged. That's obvious, surely. I didn't bring you out here to torture you for the fun of it. Decker sat on the steps and watched with a haggard expression. Merton's eyed him for a moment to make sure he wasn't about to make a sudden rush, hands outstretched to use the lethal touch. Then he went to work. Evidently, he prepared for this moment. He crisscrossed the floor efficiently, gathering bricks one-handed from caches deep in the shadowy recesses of the cabin. Soon, there was a very large number of them laid out on the ground in neatly ordered rows, carefully arranged, so that there was an inch or two of clearance between them on all sides. While he worked, Mertens kept a wary eye on Decker. Men's sized statues are difficult to sell, he said, laying out another brick. Too big to transport easily and too recognisable, and, well, he tilted his head towards the spot where the golden head and arm protruded from the sand. 
Not everybody likes their statues screaming their heads off. Decker swallowed. That wasn't a statue, was it? Mertens didn't even bother to reply. He set out another brick. Ingots, he said conversationally. That's the most useful format. Easy to move, easy to sell. Nothing to harm anyone, either. Just nice, anonymous blocks of solid gold. He stood up. Right, Decker. Get to work on those. Will you tell me how to stop it if I do that? When I'm ready, said Mertens coolly. We'll want more than this. There's no point in thinking small scale. It's amazing how fast a person can run through cash. And we won't get the full market value of the ingots, of course. No hallmarks. He looked Decker in the eyes, holding his gaze as though he wanted to prove his own sincerity. This will make you rich too, you know. Eventually. I wasn't lying about that. I want to stop it now. Sorry, Mertens made a rueful face. No can do. You work first and later, I'll tell you. He backed away carefully and stood at a little distance. Decker got to his feet a little unsteadily. He descended the steps, stumbled, and for a moment it looked as though he would tumble down the remaining flight. Mertens made no move to catch him. After a moment, Decker regained his balance and came the rest of the way down. He stood for a moment, looking at the bricks. Then he sank to his knees, putting out his hands, and got to work. It wasn't unpleasant, the sensation of turning things. The seething feeling didn't hurt. Indeed, the prickling was almost sensuous. Decker learned as he went on that the quality of the touch affected the rate of the transformation. A firm grasp had an almost instantaneous effect, but a tentative touch with fingertips would send the change running across the brick in a wave. He worked for a long time, diligently, praying to earn his freedom. When all the bricks were gold, he looked up at Merton's. But Merton shook his head. Not yet. I'll take as many of these as I can carry now. I'll come back tomorrow with more, and with the means to transport them out of here. And what do I do until then? choked out Decker, desperately. You stay here tonight, you'll manage, said Mertens. It's warm enough, even at night, this time of year. The river water is clean if you want to drink, though you'll have to put your face in it. You bastard, said Decker. Sticks and stones, said Mertens. You'll thank me when we're both rich. Probably. He anticipated Decker's move and fled towards the entrance of the cave before Decker was even fully on his feet. Don't try it, he warned Decker, his chest heaving. Decker had alarmed him. If you do, we're both dead. He watched until he was sure Decker had understood that he wasn't going to make a sudden lunge, and then he turned and disappeared down the river bank as swiftly as he could. Decker's shoulders slumped. After a few moments he went to the mouth of the cave and looked out. Mertens had already reached the bottom of the slope and was retreating up the riverbed at a smart pace. Decker had rattled him. That night, as he sat shivering in the mouth of the cave, it was cool enough to be uncomfortable, whatever Mertens had said, Decker thought about laying hands on the other man. Revenge would certainly be sweet. Besides, what guarantee did he have that Mertens would help him once he'd created enough gold to fund the high life forever? Perhaps, he thought, there isn't any cure for this, and Mertens is stringing me along. I wouldn't put it past him, the bastard. He began to feel the pressing need to urinate. In spite of what Mertens had said about not turning himself into gold, the thought of touching any part of his body made him nervous. If there's a way out of this, I don't know what it is, he thought. He looked up at the night sky, at the distant stars. Nothing touched them. They kept on moving along their accustomed paths across the sky, no matter what happened down here. I suppose, thought Decker, I have to trust him. It seems insane, but then nothing that's happened since I met him in that cafe has seemed sane either. Maybe there's a chance he really does know how to stop this happening. Maybe we really will be rich, beyond our wildest dreams, living out our lives as millionaires. But he was very afraid it wasn't so. At last the pain in his distended bladder made him reckless. He had to piss. Before he did, though, he pushed back his sleeve and touched his own forearm experimentally with his fingertips. Nothing happened. I guess Mertens was telling the truth about that anyway. Decker went outside and stood a few metres away from the cave. He took a deep breath and unbuttoned himself and took out his penis. He urinated for what seemed like a long time, sighing with relief. When he did up his trousers again, the fabric had the stiff texture of woven wire, and the buttons were of gold so pure he could have scratched it with a nail. 
After that he lay down and did his best to sleep. In spite of the temperature and hard ground, sheer exhaustion drew him into itself. He woke after dawn and staggered, stiff-legged to the riverbed, where he flung himself face down at the edge and put his mouth into the water. When he sat up on his heels, there were two hand-shaped golden marks on the gritty earth. He looked for something to eat, berries or wild grains, but found nothing. Later he defecated behind the rocks. There was no way to clean himself with his hands, so afterwards he stripped off garments that gleamed dully in the morning sun and stood waist-deep in the river. He watched the water flowing past him. After a while he put his hands into it experimentally and saw trails of liquid gold flowing away from him, downstream. He wept again, and in the sunshine his tears, too, were golden. Mertens came back around noon. He was accompanied by a donkey. Decker sat in the mouth of the cave and watched the two of them approaching, man and donkey. He felt no surprise. Nothing could be surprising any more. The donkey had probably come in the back of a pickup truck. Mertens kept a wary distance from Decker, as before. He unloaded food, some kind of stew with grains, and a battered metal spoon. He did all of this with his left hand. The right was still in his pocket. He also had bottles of soft drinks, which he opened, inserting a straw into each. Then he backed away, still eyeing Decker carefully. Decker ate with golden cutlery. Once he forgot and picked up a fallen chunk of meat with his fingers, biting on it nearly broke his teeth. He spat gall onto the sand. While Decker ate, Mertens unloaded bricks and loaded up ingots. He glanced towards Decker so often that it began to unnerve him. Decker turned his back while he ate to show that he meant no harm. In truth, he wasn't sure that he didn't wish Mertens harm, but he still cherished the hope that Mertens knew how to save him. After Decker had eaten, he worked as he had before, turning bricks into gold. Sometimes he looked at Mertens to see how he was reacting, whether he looked satisfied yet. He tried talking to Mertens too, persuading him. There's enough now, he said. There must be millions of dollars worth here. It's enough. He looked at Mertens, shaking his head, and tried again. I don't need any of this. I don't want to be rich. If I don't take anything, we only need half as much. He stretched out his hands towards another brick, and they were trembling. I wanted to stop, Mertens. When is it enough? Soon, said Mertens. Not yet. He finished loading the donkey. He said, maybe tomorrow. In fact, it was two more nights before Mertens decided that he had enough gold. Decker was losing weight, in spite of the food Mertens brought him, and he was growing a beard. He looked hollow-eyed and wild, trembling on the brink of desperation. Probably Mertens judged that he was becoming too unpredictable, that it wasn't worth the risk of Decker touching him by accident or on purpose, not when he'd already carted away a king's ransom. He transported the last of the gold away by donkey, and then came back. He had a haversack over his shoulder, and he was carrying a machete. Decker was sitting at the mouth of the cave when Mertens came up the slope. He saw the machete and began to laugh. His laugh had a high cracked sound and Mertens stopped. Decker got himself under control. He wiped his mouth with the back of his hand. Have you come to kill me? he asked. No, Mertens told him. I've come to save you. He took his right hand out of his pocket. Or at least he would have done, if he'd had a hand. His right wrist terminated in a stump. It had healed over with healthy skin, but it had an ugly, gnarled look to it, as though the amputation had been inexpertly done. This is how I save you, said Mertens. He looked at Decker, not unsympathetically. The same way I saved myself. I had the curse to Decker. The Midas touch. There's only one way to get rid of it. No, said Decker, shaking his head. There must be another way. There isn't. Believe me, said Mertens. Do you think I would have done this to myself if there was? You only touched it with one hand, croaked Decker. Yeah, it's too bad you touched it with both. But if I told you what would happen, you might not have touched it at all. And we need the money, don't we? Both of us. Mertens wielded the machete, swinging it through the air in an almost absent-minded way. Anyway, they can do great things with prosthetics these days. It's not like you won't have the cash. Hell, get yourself a pair of bionic hands. You'll hardly know the difference. Decker looked at him so balefully that Merton stopped in his tracks. The swinging motion of the machete came to a halt. Hey, he said, I could just have left you here. You do realise that. I still could. 
Try to walk out and you'll die of heat stroke or thirst. Even supposing you made it to the nearest village, if they got a sniff of what's wrong with you, they'd beat you to death. Decker put his head in his hands. So why did you come back? He said. Because I'm not a complete bastard, whatever you may think. And look, Decker, if you try anything, if you try to touch me, you'll die anyway. Think about it. If you put me out of the picture, well, you'll still have the machete. The moment you picked it up, it'd be pure gold. If it were sharp enough, you might be able to slash your skin, but you'd never get through bone with it. But supposing you did, supposing you managed to get one hand off, how are you going to do the other one? Mertens shook his head ruefully. No, you need me to do this for you. He's right, Decker thought. Still, he hesitated. I'll bleed to death, he said. Maybe that's the plan, said a voice at the back of his mind. He considered, it would be quick anyway, quicker than dying out here in the desert. I've got tourniquets, said Mertens, patting the haversack, and antiseptic. It'll be as clean as I can make it. Anesthetic? Ah, no, Mertens shook his head regretfully. But I'll be quick, I promise you. I'm strong with my left hand now. I've had enough practice. I don't really have any choice, do I? said Decker at last. Not really, old son. Then let's get it over with. Merton set up his makeshift surgical theatre on a large, flat-topped block of stone, covering it with a clean cloth. Decker watched him putting out tourniquet strips, dressings, a bottle of surgical spirit. He watched Merton's clean the machete with the spirit. He looked down at his own hands. I'll never feel anything with these again, he said to himself. Oh, Merton's is right about prosthetics. They can make me new hands, ones that can feed me and dress me and type letters. But I won't be able to feel with them, not properly. I'll never feel the petals of a flower again, nor blades of grass under my fingers. I'll never run my hand through a woman's hair, nor feel the softness of a woman's breast. Then he thought about what would happen if he tried to touch any of those things now, and he shuddered. Mertens took his trembling as a sign of fear. We should do this now before you lose your nerve, he said. He nodded. Put your right hand on that flat stone, and pull your sleeve back so I can see what I'm doing. Decker stretched out his hand, pushing back his sleeve, and laid it on the stone. The fingernails were ingrained with dirt, and the wrist looked pathetically slender. Mertens would be able to hack through it without much trouble. He might manage it in one blow, like a farmer decapitating a chicken. Would the hand still be dangerous when it was separated from its owner? That was unknown territory. Probably Mertens wouldn't want to take the risk. He might use the flat of the machete blade to swap the hand away into a dusty corner of the cave, as though it were an enormous spider. Decker's hand clenched involuntarily. He had to force himself to relax. Get on with it, he said through gritted teeth. Mertens stepped close, so close that his shadow fell across Decker, who cringed by the stone. He raised his free hand, gripping the machete so firmly that his knuckles showed white. Decker heard him take a deep breath, tensing himself for the downward swing. That moment seemed to solidify about the two men, as though time itself had been touched by the Phrygian curse. Mertens made a sound in his throat, an abortive sound, like a strangled mew. Decker glanced up at the sound, and it seemed to him that he caught the tail end of movement as Merton's head turned. The blond man's face contorted, the green eyes widening, the lips drawing back from the teeth. Then it froze. The blade of the machete did not descend. Merton's shadow lying across Decker did not move and flow. Merton's exposed skin, tanned and glistening faintly with perspiration, acquired a dull golden patina that hardened with savage swiftness into the brash gleam of solid metal. His shirt the fabric of which had been flowing with the movement of his body, froze like a photographic image, motion preserved as stillness. The shriek that would undoubtedly have issued from Merton's lips, if a few more seconds had been allowed to him, was represented instead by a curiously resonant sound, like the high note of a singing bowl. It shivered away into a silence, broken only by Decker's rapid breathing. For a moment Decker remained where he was, knees bent, one hand still outstretched on the flat-topped stone, the other encircling Merton's ankle in the space between the top of his boot and the rumpled fabric of his trouser leg. He had touched warm bare skin, now his fingers clasped cool, hard metal.
He could feel the hairs on Merton's calf as tiny golden wires. Decker let go of Merton's with a shudder of revulsion. He got to his feet, leaning heavily on the stone for support. Even when he was upright, he swayed unsteadily. He only looked at Merton's once, at the gleaming golden face that screamed in silent horror. Then he stumbled past him, making for the mouth of the cave, for sunshine and fresh air. There he sat down abruptly on the sandy ground, with his back to Merton's, and covered his face with his hands. I killed someone, he said to himself, though he wasn't sure that fully encompassed what he'd done. It occurred to him that touching Merton's leg was the last time he would ever feel the warmth of anyone's skin but his own under his fingers. Decker sat there for a long time. He knew that what Merton's had said was true. When he'd ended Merton's existence, he had ended his own. Even assuming there was a driver waiting up on the bank of the river, the man would take off when he saw it was Decker who was approaching, and not Merton's. If there was an empty vehicle waiting up there, it would turn to gold the moment he touched any part of it. Pure, soft gold. Decker was no engineer, but he was fairly certain that the engine wouldn't run, and he knew what awaited him if he made it to the village. No, he thought, I'm dead too. The realisation was not as frightening as he thought. Somehow, it seemed right. At last the day itself began to die. The shadows lengthened, the sun sank very low in the west, and the sky was beautifully tinted with shades of pale and glowing flame. The sunset was reflected in Decker's eyes, as he watched the entire world turn to gold.